Hello everyone, this is Eric, the Asian Movie Enthusiast, and welcome to part one of our exploration of Asian horror films released in 2017. If you're a newer subscriber and you're unfamiliar with this playlist of videos, I basically do a mini-review of every single Asian horror movie I've seen in chronological order. There are currently 83 videos that precede this one, which cover a grand total of over 800 Asian horror movies. Now, I will include a link to the playlist in the description box below, and I suggest that you check out a few, if not most, of my prior videos because they do provide a bunch of recommendations while also providing a healthy sample size of titles that will you know, give you a good feel of what kinds of movies have been produced by these industries over the years. There are a lot of misconceptions out there regarding Asian horror, and this playlist is intended to rectify some of those. So our next year of coverage is 2017. So I'm going to review 32 Asian horror movies from this particular year over the course of four videos. Uh, the last year we covered less than 30 movies was 2011, which represented the lowest availability since 2003. So we've been on a pretty solid production streak for 13 of the last 14 years, at least in terms of movies that are available to international audiences. So let's knock out the um, honorable mentions first, okay? Remember, these are movies that some people might classify as horror films, but I do not. And the only one worth mentioning is Missing 2 from South Korea. Remember, uh, remember that movie Missing from 2009? It's kind of a torture horror flick. Had a few unexpected events in it. Well, they made a sequel in name only. That's an incredibly boring dramatic thriller that contributes no compelling drama and no legitimate thrills. So do not watch it. If you don't believe me, check out the trailer for Missing 2 on YouTube. And it looks as bad as it is. <laughs> from the, they couldn't even put, a, put together a good trailer for the movie. So let's get to the meat of the video here. All right. As usual... I always begin with the worst Asian horror movie of the year and then gradually work my way up to the best Asian horror movie of the year in part four of, of each year, right? So part one of these videos is always full to the brim with, that's right, dumpster juice. So get ready to walk through a snake farm on our way to the local clown college because we have 11 movies to talk about tonight. It's going to be a little painful for me, but remember, titles for all the movies I discuss will be listed in the description box below. Now, when thinking of the worst Asian horror film from this year, it was kind of a close call between our bottom two. It was a competition, but I ultimately decided on Net I Die from 2017, and this is from Thailand. The recent trend of social media commercialism is put to the test in this horror flick. Popular idols have been launching their own brand name cosmetics for big bucks. To translate this to 2022 terms, they're shaking their butts on OnlyFans and selling fake eyelashes. Companies have gathered the most popular internet idols for these advertisements in an effort to put on a, a dazzling display of cosmetics. But then, the horror emerges. Monica, a big internet celebrity, hangs herself live on her video channel. A year later... Idols begin dying in hor horrific acts of violence. All of them were tagged in Monica's last video. And, uh, yeah, we go through the usual shenanigans. So, first of all, let's get the obvious thing out of the way and simply point out that the title, Net I Die, is incredibly stupid. It just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Net I Die. I guess it's supposed to be like a play on Net Idols? Net idol, net I die. I mean, it's really lame. It really is. Now, talking about the scares, the horror scenes are short-lived, not impactful. They rely on cheap jumps and loud booms. You know, you all know by now that I usually don't like that stuff. The filmmakers don't even bother to set them up properly or build suspense. You know, a movie begins with a ghost harassing and murdering a random girl in a live stream. It's kind of mediocre stuff. I mean, there are a few pretty good shots in the film of bodies in weird contortions and positions, but those shots really don't last very long. The rooftop finale is lame, totally forgettable. Scare tactics pretty much fail miserably. Character development, 
and story are pretty bland in this. There does seem to be some satire here regarding how female influencers essentially objectify themselves to make a quick buck. But it's a very shallow exploration, and the dialogue is pretty tedious. It's pretty a thoughtless, incompetent script in my eyes. Lots of dull filler to sit through. It's only 85 minutes long, but it's it, it, it's slow. It's a slow 85 minutes. I mean, how is that possible? Well, there are entire scenes that are completely pointless. Um, I would have hoped that they would have progressed the story a little bit faster. You know, sometimes I do complain about the, the generic Asian horror ghosts film that has the curse investigation element, um, but it's still better than this movie. <laughs> <laughs> you know, even the generic curse investigation uh, movies are, are better than this one. Uh, so yeah, this one's a, pretty much a chore to sit through. Very little content to mine out of it, and there's not even that much. It's not even that much uh, fun to watch. You know, the trailer makes the movie look a little bit better than what it actually is, but it's just uh, I don't know. All the good shots are in the trailer. Let's put it that way. Acting's underwhelming. Although I did enjoy the appearance of the actress from Girl From Nowhere, which is actually a very entertaining uh, Thai television series, so you'll see her in this for a bit. But, uh, you know, despite all that I've said, Net I Die is still not quite as atrocious as some of the other films that have received the prestigious title of Worst Asian Horror Film of the Year, but it is worthless enough to be worthy of the title. So, if you're, even if you're a diehard fan of Thai horror, I think you should skip this. Um, it's available on YouTube. Uh, yeah, so have fun. Our second film this evening is not much better. We're going to Japan for Corpse Prison Parts 1 and 2. From the moment she and her fellow students arrive in the mountain village of Yasaka, Mikoto knows that there is something very wrong with this tiny town. Can it really be true that for 50 years... Not a single woman has been born in this isolated community. Despite the fact that the village chief and other male residents have enthusiastically welcomed her and her other three co-eds to their attending an overnight seminar, Mikoto can't shake the sense of increasing dread that consumes her. Something horrible, terrible, has happened here before. So this is not to be confused with the Corpse Party movies, which were a completely different franchise. Corpse Prison is essentially one giant movie that was split into two 75-minute parts, part one and two. It does have direct-to-video production values, a slight exploitation feel. There are a few slightly sleazy moments, but nothing too crazy. The opening scene shows a girl getting her leg chopped off by rabid villagers, and I immediately suspected that this could be a direct ripoff of the entertaining Kenta Fukasaku film X-Cross from 2007. Corpse Prison was apparently based on a manga, but that manga seemed to be written after X-Cross was made, so I don't know what's going on here. What I do know is that X-Cross is way more satisfying than this movie. But to be fair, the setup in this film really isn't that bad. You know, they make some references to local folklore, leg am amputation ceremonies, etc. Some of the story elements are decent in concept, but they're not developed in interesting ways and any potential is left untapped. I like the idea of a little girl character in this. They do some different things with her, but she's barely in the movie and not really developed well. Zero suspense, no really foreboding atmosphere at all between the horror scenes, which hurts. No sense of urgency to this, and the pacing is slow. There's dull filler to sit through, uh, mostly for the opening 50 minutes, really. Uh, we need some tighter editing and a shorter runtime. The attack scenes are very lacking in style. Characters are very sluggish. Direction is flat. Um, the leg chop at the very beginning of the movie is probably the best bit of gore in the entire film. And the final death of one of the murderers is completely unacceptable. It's just so stupid. Uh, slasher style movies that have no good death scenes are some of the most difficult horror films to sit through. They really are. It's, it's miserable. And you, you need to compensate with something else. If you're not going to give me good death scenes, you got to compensate for something else. Suspense, atmosphere, script writing, whatever. This movie doesn't do that. So it's a pretty bad flick. Do not recommend it. It was a blind buy. It's available on Region A Blu-ray in the U.S. 
I bought him, and uh, I, re I kind of regret it. I, I'll be honest with you. We're region hopping again. We tend to region hop in these videos. Everybody contributes. In, in, in For Asian horror, everyone usually contributes at least one crappy horror film each year. So now we go to Hong Kong. And this one is Always Be With You, a Hong Kong horror anthology. One of the most shocking things about this movie is that it is, it is officially the 20th installment in the Troublesome Night franchise. I did not know that going into this. The last installment I covered in this playlist was part 10, which was released in 2001. I mean, this franchise got so bad, I refused to seek out the rest. In all fairness, a few of the earlier entries are quite enjoyable and worth watching, but can this modern day rekindle those old flames of entertainment value? Well, actor Louis Koo returns. He appeared in a number of earlier installments, and Herman Yao returns to direct. He directed multiple installments, so you're saying there's a chance. Troublesome Night 20 is not an anthology strictly. It, it kind of bounces in between the different stories throughout the runtime, and the stories intersect a few times. They're not really cleanly segmented like a traditional anthology might be. So story one, after being diagnosed with terminal cancer, a taxi driver causes a car accident that kills a man. The victim's fiancé, played by Charlene Choi, one half of twins, decides to open a seaside resort because it was her fiancé's wish, but that location becomes a lightning rod for inexplicable suicides, and the cab driver decides to help her. Story two is about a crematorium worker who steals the possessions of dead people and sells them for the purpose of settling his gambling debts. Bad idea. Story three is about a married couple, the husband played by Louis Koo, of course, who find a vinyl record that is possessed by an unknown supernatural force. And I'm pretty sorry to say this anthology is unimpressive. There's an accident scene that occurs during the opening 10 minutes, and it made me laugh. Like, the car accident itself, I guess, was fine. But then a girl jumps off a building, coincidentally, at the exact same moment and lands on top of one of the crashed vehicles. It's just like, you can tell the scriptwriters wanted to punch you in the face with a tragic moment to start the film, but, uh, and they went, then they wanted to like lock your attention in, right? So you're interested in like the repercussions of that event and the flashback scenes that get us to that event, but that scene is so abbreviated and it's rushed and kind of lame that it doesn't have any impact. Even if there was a supernatural force that brought this together, the, the execution of the opening scene isn't good enough to make you want to care about it, right? Or make you want to know what happened. And that earlier moment gives you an idea of what to expect in this entire film. There's a subplot that develops with about a woman with a deformed face that is <clears throat> pretty dumb and obnoxious. Everything about the film just feels so shoddy and amateuristic. Uh, scare tactics are flimsy. I don't remember most of them. The one I do remember involves a ghost girl in a closet who possesses a record player, and it's freaking hilarious. Another gut-busting scene uh, is the expanded version of the car accident. So they show it at the beginning, then they show the expanded version later on, and it's, it's not good. Performances range from pretty good to pretty poor. Attempts at melodrama fall flat on their face. You definitely get the feel of a shoddy production, and it's actually quite dull. A lot of filler in this 98-minute film. No dramatic impact. It's really surprising because Herman Yao is a pretty consistent director uh, from a variety of genres, but this is, this is one of his worst films that I've seen. So I'll skip it. Always Be With You is available on YouTube. All right, now we go to China. Move from Hong Kong to China. And this one is called... The Door. A few years ago, a movie crew filmed in an abandoned, decrepit factory, but encountered a fire that resulted in the death of the actress. Now, they return to the factory to finish shooting that scene. Not exactly the smartest decision in the world, because strange things begin happening on set. One dude even brings his little daughter with him. For what reason? I have no idea. Uh, this movie stinks anyways. It's not even worth figuring out. So if you look up this movie online, you may be tempted to endure its 82-minute runtime. This is not very long. All right, this is a theme tonight. 
short horror films that just you can't sit through. But you would make a mistake in trying to sit through this one. It feels a lot longer, a lot of dead weight. People sit around, walk around, have boring conversations, completely detached from the main threat. It really annoys me when movies have like an immediate danger present for most of the film, but none of the characters act like there's danger present. You know, you gotta have a sense of urgency in a film like this, you know? Would have really helped. A few years ago, I read an article that complimented the death scenes, and I'm not seeing it. Some of the death scenes were not even shown. Instead, we get some slightly bloody bodies after the fact. In other cases, a brief attack is shown, but it's mostly unimpressive. Uh, pretty commonplace and predictable stuff here. At one point, a character gets scared by her shadow. You know, and you get a loud boom noise uh, to supplement the jump. And then uh, another character jumps in front of the camera with a mask on to, like, scare another character. You know, you've seen this stuff a million times. It's just, <coughs> it's just not good quality stuff. Character themselves are not very good. There's a goofy big guy. Puts on, like, battle armor when things go bad. Then he stumbles around, falls over himself, and whines most of the time. It's bad. Um, there are a small handful of moments of good direction, though, and framing of shots. There is a little bit of style to this, which uh, kind of helped a l uh, definitely. Um, but those moments are kind of temporary. And the ending is a huge cliche. It's been done a th better than a thousand other films. So this movie isn't that much better than the films we've covered already, but it <clears throat> I felt like the moments uh, of style in this kind of gave it just a leg up over some of the other films that you know the bottom two let's say or three so but it's still not good the door is on youtube all right the next one we got to go back to japan unfortunately and this is the of course 2017 film vampire night a police officer and her younger sister who is an archer with an injured elbow Visit a Ryokan, located deep in the mountains. What the sisters don't know is that this traditional inn, famous for a nearby hot spring with healing qualities, is in fact a den for vampires. They're also a team of uh, paintball players who are practicing in the nearby forest. And what about the badly acted pretty boy who dresses in a purple magician's outfit and looks into his CGI deficient magic ball? Well, you have to watch the film to find out. The parents of these sisters were murdered when they were little, and this is shown in the opening scene. The film takes itself seriously enough, which is kind of surprising. Uh, <clears throat> when you look at the, the poster art, you're thinking this is going to be a horror comedy. But it does take itself seriously enough. There are some slightly amusing scenes, and a decent pace after things get rolling, but it takes half the film to reach that point. It's not enough. I mean, the problem is that there's a lot of dead weight you need to sit through, Despite a 73 minute long run time. I feel I sound like a broken record, don't I, tonight? And this is kind of a problem with bad horror movies with lower budgets. You know, it's just like uh, lots of not so interesting moments and discussions between the characters to pad out that runtime to feature length. You're just waiting for the vampires to show up, and when they do show up, they're disappointing. I mean, the vampire makeup effects are awful in this. I mean, man, just get a decent makeup artist, for goodness sakes. And the attack scenes are not good. I know this had a low budget. Could have been shot better. Uh, at times, you lose the sense of geography during the attacks. You get repetitive close-up shots of vampires, and then close-up shots of people with a weapon strike in between. It's just like lots of shaky cam thrown in, too. It's, it's not good. This movie suffers immensely from just bad direction alone and editing. There are some other little annoyances here and there, like super close-ups of people shoving food in their mouths, which I, I typically always dislike. Acting's pretty bad. I mean, on a positive note, the musical st score is actually pretty solid. I did like the score in this. And some of the lighting's pretty good for a low-budget film. And like I said, pacing during the second half's better than the first, but at, at that point, it was just it was too late. <clears throat> I don't recommend this. It's available on Region 2 DVD without subs. If you could find it streaming somewhere without subs, maybe check it out, but uh, I still don't recommend it. All right. We have a co-production here, which is pretty interesting. 
It's a co-production between China, Malaysia, and Thailand. All right, what do we got? It's called Haunted Hotel, also called Haunted Road 2. A female tourist from China and her entourage arrive in Malaysia and decide to vacation in Genting Highlands. However, there was some confusion during their stay, and somehow they ended up staying in one of Asia's most haunted hotels. Well, that's just bad luck, you know? The movie follows their terrifying journey as they try to escape the hotel once they realize the trouble that they're in. So again, international production, international cast, sometimes that could be interesting, right? I mean, the Korean action movie, The Thieves, is a great example of, that, of how that can work. Some Hong Kong actors in there, etc., Unfortunately, Haunted Hotel is less successful in that regard. Per the website MoviesAndMania.com, director Ryan Lee revealed that they shot two versions of the movie concurrently. The reason was that they needed to present a version for the China market, of course, that did not feature ghosts, of course, <clears throat> due to the no-ghost regulation imposed by the China Film Bureau. Only the China Film Bureau can come up with a regulation that's stupid, right? And, uh, you know, it requires censorship over promotion of the occult or whatever crap they call it, right? So that was pretty interesting I saw, like, in the production. You need two separate versions, right? I'm not sure which version I saw because I was confused with this film. The dialogue was entirely in Mandarin. So I'm like, oh, I saw the Chinese version, but the ending seemed to confirm the existence of the ghosts. So I, I really don't know. The ghost design is pretty generic, kind of creepy. Have those large black holes for the eyes, which, you know, it's, it's generic at this point. But, I don't know, there's a little bit of a creep factor to it. Uh, it does rely a bit too heavily on cheap jumps. If you're familiar with this channel, you know I don't like jump scares generally. Pretty lazy and annoying stuff. Um, a lot of the jumps in this movie involve close-ups of the ghost faces. Or reflections on objects that the characters are looking at. But to this film's credit, it does try a few other kinds of scares during the second half. That was nice to see. I'm like, okay, this movie's getting better now. It gets a little bit more interesting as it moves along. But the execution overall, it's kind of average overall. You know, it evens out. Second half's better than the first, but it's just, uh, it's not enough to make up for its flaws. Story's pretty static. Same with the characters. It feels kind of like an underwhelming Hollywood ghost film from like the mid-2000s on a lower budget. You know, just kind of run of the mill, but it's still an upgrade over some of the movies we've covered so far tonight. Now, this movie is available on YouTube, but without subtitles, without subs. All right. <clears throat> well, it's time for Korea to throw their hand in the mix. You know, let's where South Korea. Where you at? You have an underwhelming horror film for 2017. Nice. Let's let's cover it. And that is House of the Disappeared. This is kind of like a horror-drama hybrid. The opening scene shows our main protagonist, a woman who finds her husband stabbed in a corridor within their home. She's falsely arrested and sentenced to long-term imprisonment for murder. And then the film cuts to almost three decades later and she's released from the penitentiary. And this tormented woman returns to the home. Determined to confront the mysterious and deadly curse that still plagues the house. Now, this is a remake of The House at the End of Time, a Venezuelan film that I have seen. Um, anytime I see a movie that I want to watch and I, I know it's a remake before I watch it, I usually seek out the original first before seeing the remake, and that's the case here. <clears throat> the original film, yeah, I wasn't that big of a fan of the original. You know, it, it spends a lot of time in flashback mode. Uh... I found it to be a pretty underwhelming movie. Dialogue heavy, script is dry. None of the scares were that impactful. You know what I mean? It's lots of jump scares. The protagonists are pretty unlikable, unrelatable. Um, especially in the original film, she just mopes and whines a lot in that movie. Like, lady, your life might suck, but just whining about it all the time is not, it's not a compelling character arc, you know? Uh, there's a scene on a baseball field that's, I don't know about that one. <laughs> the twist is okay, but it has minimal impact. So I'm not even a fan of the original. So going into this remake, I actually assumed the remake would be better, and it's not. It's, it's, it's not. 
almost as underwhelming. I mean, I think the production values are better in the Korean remake. That only counts for so much. Just like the original, the characters in the story are just mediocre, you know, and you have jump scares again. Dodgy acting is used to portray some of the older characters, but uh, I do think Kim Yoon Jin from Shiri, who I'm a fan of, is pretty good as usual, but her scenes as an elderly version of herself didn't quite land as well as I think they were hoping. You get, like, the generic spiritual advisor scenes, you know, plays out exactly like you would expect it would. And uh, overall, most of the film plays out very similarly to the original. A little bit of atmosphere, but, uh, yeah, I, I didn't like it. They did eliminate the baseball scene in the remake, which was a very good choice. Pretty disappointing film. I actually do not recommend this. I think some people online did enjoy it. It might be one to take a chance on. This is one out of all the films I'm covering tonight. If you're a huge fan of Korean horror, you could check it out. You might disagree with me, but uh, I was not impressed with House of the Disappeared. It's on Region 3 DVD if you want it. All right, next film tonight. We're going back to China on this one. And that is... The House That Never Dies, Part 2, Reawakening. This is a sequel to the hit film that I reviewed previously and thought it was pretty good, the original. A hundred years after the mysterious murders of the entire Zisheng household, a cultural relic restorer experiences strange events at the ancient mansion. After discovering baby skeletons and weird spells, that's freaky, the intricate weaving of the past and present begin to emerge and reveals a haunting tale of the wrongly deceased still seeking justice from the living world. This was directed by Zhou Chen, a guy who has given us at least one truly awful horror film. <laughs> the Apostles comes to mind. I covered The Apostles earlier in this playlist, and wow, the movie was horrible. He did direct Zombie Fight Club, which... I think it's kind of a, a guilty pleasure in some aspects. A lot of people hate that one, too. But in any case, I do think the direction and the editing are decent in The House That Never Dies Part 2. Not as good as the original film, though. It was directed by someone else. Some nice use of color at times. Nice bonus. Like the original film, some of the actors play multiple characters, one in the present and one in the past, and performances are good enough. Jillian Chung shows up, the other half of Twin. We have... Both twins here tonight. How, how nice. And she has a supporting role as a possible seductress who is in the house as part of the main character's job project. And she does a pretty good job in this. Strange stuff happens almost immediately. Uh, the movie does not waste time getting started. The big problem is that the story from the past is less compelling than the original film. It's pretty dry, blandly written, takes up a lot of runtime. You know, I do think the opening is engaging enough, but overall it's kind of a slow, lethargic film. The ending is the same as almost every other Chinese horror movie involving ghosts. Uh, although, I do remember the first film in this franchise kind of mixing it up with its ending. You know, maybe less censorship-friendly, in my opinion, than the original film was. I don't know if they kind of slipped that one by the, by the censorship board, or if maybe I'm, I'm missing something. I mean, yeah, the ending of this one's just like, it's bad. Scarce a run of the mill, forgettable, less visually interesting than its predecessor. There's a CGI baby face shows up early. You know you're in trouble after you see that. There are multiple CGI face shots in this. Guys, are makeup effects artists extinct? Multiple movies tonight have horrible makeup effects. Like, these guys can't be that expensive. <laughs> I mean, does nobody do makeup effects anymore? It's all just computer generated? It's unreal. Like, even if you have a low-budget film, there's ways of doing decent makeup effects. I mean, come on. Scares are run-of-the-mill, forgettable. And, uh, yeah, there's a few gimmicks for, for 3D effect. Just a mediocre effort. Again, not as bad as some of the other stuff we covered tonight, but not saying much. Uh, this is on YouTube. <clears throat> The next film tonight is from Vietnam. Everyone's chipping in, folks. And this is KFC. Okay. 
Pure evil exists. It lives in Hanoi, in a small house that has been partly converted into an operating theater torture chamber hybrid. Here, patients are cut up into bite-sized pieces and assaulted by a cannibalistic doctor and his tech-a-turn sidekick. His son, now also addicted to the taste of human flesh, befriends the children of a prostitute who fell victim to the deadly doctor. And this amoral violence is passed on to the next generation. This is a cycle of cruelty set in motion. So this is basically a crime film that's blended with horror, which is pretty cool in premise. The movie begins with multiple disclaimers that it's not based on a real story. Obviously. Uh, it opens with a guy talking and eating some Kentucky Fried Chicken. So, the title, if you were wondering, KFC, you mean like Kentucky Fried Chicken? And yeah, like Kentucky Fried Chicken, apparently. They named the film after the, the franchise. Fantastic. In any case, character finishes off one of his victims, but an unexpected event occurs and the viewer may be intrigued as to where to the film goes from there. Now, this is kind of an homage to splatter flicks. There is some bloody violence to enjoy. Also some assaults, so just be wary. But we get some street gang violence that mix, that's mixed in with the murder and torture. Sufficiently violent. Not exactly memorable, though. This ain't the sadness, folks, all right? My main problem with this movie is that there are so many wafer-thin characters, and the violence is so random that it lacks impact. I mean, there's basically no story to this. And we just keep jumping from character to character to character to character. I'm like, okay, who's this guy? Why are we following the him now? Okay, what, what's the, why are we, can we just stick with, like, a character for a little while here? It's so unfocused, and it's difficult to be interested in what's happening. It feels like a series of, like, vignettes or something that are stitched together. And it becomes very monotonous and disengaging. So, despite the presence of some pretty good violence at times, it's just very lethargic. And I, did, I didn't like it. And it's only one hour and nine minutes long. It's, uh, I have no desire to watch it again. It's kind of a shame. <clears throat> you know, you think of something like uh, a low-budget Japanese film like Oregon, which is, you know, not for everybody, but it's got, like, a little bit of that crime aspect mixed in with the, the body horror, plant body horror vibe stuff. And that movie's interesting enough to keep you going, right? This, this film should have been like that, but it just didn't, with the cannibalism aspect, but it just didn't come through. Um, KFC is difficult to find. I'm pretty sure I saw it on Daily Motion, but I couldn't find it when I looked for it again recently. I saw this one a few years ago. So, yep. Two left, folks. We're almost done. We're almost done. All right, we have... The Doll 2 from Indonesia. Our protagonist's family consists of a married couple, their little daughter, and their maid. The little girl unfortunately dies, which is sad, which causes the family to spiral into depression. The mother decides to use her deceased daughter's doll as a medium to communicate with her, which is, of course, a really bad idea. But there are consequences in this sequel to The Doll from 2016, a movie that I previously reviewed and actually found to be watchable. So, can the sequel match the watchability of its predecessor? Well, director here is Rocky Soraya, Soraya, who apparently got a decent distribution deal because a bunch of his movies are available on some popular streaming services like Netflix. I covered uh, a few of them already, and even did a separate video for the Third Eye movies uh, a few years ago. Uh, not a fantastic director or anything, but he's, he's capable of making an entertaining horror film. The Doll 2, not one of his better efforts, unfortunately. This is similar to its predecessor, The Doll, in how it starts with some scares right off the bat, but it kind of feels rushed in doing this. Uh, there's some decent violence to enjoy, a good car accident scene, but... Then the movie kind of settles into its story, which is just not that interesting. And the runtime's almost two full hours. Unlike a lot of the other films tonight, this one really stretches the runtime, and that's a problem. Because if this one was, like, closer to 80 minutes, it may have been close to a pass grade, but there's just... It does not justify that long of a runtime. 
The scares kind of settle into mediocrity as well. Lots of jumpy moments, some of which are fake, not no real danger present. But I do kind of like the doll design. It's got big blue eyes and frizzy hair, so it's a little different. Unlike the first doll film, this one doesn't really even attempt to win you over during the middle section like that film did. There's really not, not much that's creative or inspired. It's very cliche. Uh, things do come alive during the last like half hour when the violence ramps up, but it's too little too late, guys. Doll 2, probably the best film we've covered tonight so far. Not saying much. So that is available on Netflix. Final film this evening, and we go to the Philippines. I'm telling you, everyone freaking contributed. We have Thailand, Japan, mainland China, Hong Kong. We got Malaysia uh, co-production. We got Korea. We got Vietnam, Indonesia, and the Philippines. <laughs> wow. Man, I didn't even notice that until now. All right. We got the debutantes from the Philippines. Our main character is a high school girl named Kate, who is awkward and unpopular. She befriends a popular girl who she tutors in mathematics, and she eventually gets invited to a, to a party. And you know what's coming. At the party, Kate is publicly embarrassed in front of everyone. Horror follows, but could there be more to the story? The premise and trailer make this movie look like a ripoff of Carrie, but it's actually kind of different in a lot of ways. You know, it, you could call it kind of a ripoff, but it's different enough, I think. The opening is actually decent. It's got a creepy score, little girl in peril. I like the opening credits, too. It shows, like, black mud getting poured over a flower that a girl's holding in her hands. First horror set piece in a parking garage is okay get a few creepy images and a death and then we get some jump scares which cheapen the film the supernatural entities do look pretty good in this though um even a bit scary there's like a humanoid monster thing which i'm always a fan of you get the humanoid monster going i'm, I'm up for it and an evil looking woman in red and whenever they're on screen it's actually pretty good regrettably most of the set pieces are constructed in underwhelming ways I and mean, you could predict the scare before it happens almost every time, and that's not good. Uh, the, the bully girls, the girls who bully our protagonist, are sufficiently unlikable, which is the point. So it's easy to root for our protagonist for a while, but she's not that great of a lead. She's mostly timid, one note most of the time. Backstory and everything is okay. Ending, not very satisfying. Just not enough here. It, do, it, it needs something. This movie needed something... To, to pick it up a notch to be like recommendable and I don't think it does uh, you know it looks nice some good use of color at times so I you know similar to the doll too the debutantes is it's not a terrible film it's got some good stuff in it uh, I think uh, the debutantes starts better than the doll the opening half hour is pretty decent but then it weakens whereas the doll too kind of strengthened near the end but it was too late so, I mean, both of these films are flimsy and forgettable, so can't recommend them. The Debutantes is on Amazon Instant if you want to rent it uh, to stream. So, yes, that concludes part one of our journey through Asian horror films released in 2017. Thankfully, we cleared out almost all of the trash in this video. Not much to see here, even in terms of flawed curiosities. I'm sure fans of Korean horror may get some enjoyment out of house of the disappeared i can see some people disagreeing with me on that and i'm i think the original has a lot of fans too so maybe that's just me i just don't really like the the story in that one so of all the films tonight that would be the one to check out and hey you know maybe the doll two or the debutantes maybe you know uh, everything else i can't really i can't really give you a, a thumbs up for but be sure to join me for part two because we will crack into a, a little batch of films that are more watchable than the ones we covered tonight. Nothing great in part two, but I think they're a step up. And remember to watch some of the older videos in this playlist, because I go back all the way to the 1920s, I think, at some point at the beginning of this. So, yeah, check them out. And as always, folks, I will see you next time.